so a quick uh, vision of the agenda. Uh, we have two presenters that are going to present two different topics. Uh, the first one will be Roberto uh, that will discuss about uh, trying to analyze um, how often lobbyists are um, coming on fundraiser of uh, Liberal. And the second talk uh, will be done by Jan uh, about autonomous driving and using uh, an Ubisoft game uh, to do that. Um, so I will just invite our HR partners uh, if they want to, to do some promotion. Um, Hi everyone, welcome at Ubisoft. So Marion and I, we are recruiters over here. So basically, just to welcome you, uh, we are a technical recruiter that are working in production and services. So working at Ubisoft, just a little word, it's super fun, daily basis. We are using the latest technology as well. For instance, in um, data, we are tracking behaviors of our players to make sure that we have a line for the next game. <laughs> Transition. Uh, we have several roles uh, in our different team. We can have some AI programmer, some data developer, uh, analyst too, for some less technical position. So don't hesitate to look it, to look at it if you uh, see what's uh, what's going on here. Um, we will be happy to discuss with you uh, during the short break. Um, don't hesitate to come to see us and discuss about everything you want. And uh, I think it's the time to introduce our in invite. Our first speaker. Mm. Yes, <laughs> our first speaker. Um, so, Roberto, you are working in Investigate Journalism Foundation. And I will let you explain what you're going to talk about. No? <laughs> All right. Hi, uh, my name is Roberto. It's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, I work for the Investigative Journalism Foundation, as uh, they said. If you haven't heard of it, no problem. Nobody has. We are brand new. We launched in uh, uh, January. Uh, we are a nonprofit or, uh, news newsroom uh, that uh, specializes in data-driven um, investigations. And I want to talk a little bit about um, the work we do. I just want to say it's a really great pleasure to uh, be presenting here at Pi Data. It's a community that I've uh, always wanted to be a part of, but I hesitated because I always had a bit of uh, imposter syndrome. Because, full disclosure, I am not a data scientist. I've never been trained in it. I've uh, never studied it formally, other than you know online courses. Um, but I kind of am at the same time. As a data journalist, I kind of straddle this funny gray zone between data science, data, uh, uh, data anal analytics, uh, storytelling, data visualization. So it's kind of like data science light. And I want to make the case that other data journalists like me can um, have a lot to contribute to the field as well, uh, even though we're not like recognized as such. So I want to start by asking if anybody knows what this is. Just blurt it out. Oh, hospital capacity um, uh, monitor. Thank you. It's the daily report of ER congestion um, in, in all of Quebec. So every hospital in Quebec has to report every day how full their ER is. How, out of how many official stretchers, CVR, right? Um, how many are actually occupied? And for the most part, there it's more than 100%. There's more people than uh, stretchers. This kind of looks kind of nice now, but I want to tell a story about 10 years ago when I was a journalist at the Montreal Gazette. This looked a lot, um, a lot less nice, less colorful, less neat. But I looked at this and I said, I want to learn how to scrape this. I'm going to learn Python just so I can scrape this, and so I can see long-term, which ERs are the most uh, congested. And so that's what I did. I taught myself Python, taught myself scraping, uh, and it scraped it every day for one year. And at the end, I was able to come up with a story that said this. 
um, that ranked these ERs over which one's the most chronically uh, over capacity. And you can see the St. Mary's, Lakeshore, Royal Victoria, doesn't exist anymore, but back then these were some of the worst. This is from 2013. Uh, that was sort of my first foray into you know, using Python to crunch data, and I've only be gotten more giddy and more intense since. After the Montreal Gazette, I went to work at the CBC, and I did a lot of data, uh, data journalism for that there too. This was an example where we compared the number of recreational facilities in each borough to income of those boroughs. And we found that there is a very neat little correlation there. You can see it can probably fit a regression model very nicely to that, where um, the wealthier the place, the more facilities there are per resident. And you can see that the bottom here, near the zero, uh, near the origin there is Montreal North, Montreal Nord. What I love about data, especially as a journalist, is that the numbers are not, are, to me, are not the story. The numbers are just the start. The numbers are the entry, the, 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 at the point towards the real story. So we sent a few reporters to Montreal North and have them talk to the community, have, have them go to hockey rinks, see how full they are. And we came back with some really great stories, including uh, a, a hockey team that had to practice in an abandoned McDonald's because there was nowhere else that they could practice. Uh, later, during COVID, I did a lot of data work with, uh, well, with COVID data. Uh, early on, we looked at um, the case counts by borough and compared it to a bunch of different uh, social demographic um, indicators. Uh, and we found that there was a very strong correlation, correlation between uh, COVID cases and the population, the percentage of, the, of black people in that borough. That and also the percentage of uh, homes that are overcrowded, that there are more people than bedrooms. So we came up with this um, uh, story. This was early before we really knew sort of the inequality of COVID. And this story was actually cited by, a, uh, by Teresa Tam in her report about the inequality of the, of the pandemic. Uh, we also wanted to look at to see if data could answer how well are people um, complying with some of the public health directives. So we compared, we see the red line there is the stringency index that was compiled by Oxford University. Every day they gave a score all over the world how strict are COVID uh, restrictions based on business closures, school closures, um, uh, curfews, all that. And we used uh, Google mobility data by province to see how well that, um, how much it fluctuated according to the, how severe the rules were. And surprisingly, you can see that it's quite symmetrical as restrictions get stronger, the mobility drops, especially at the beginning. Uh, you can see that Quebec here is remarkably symmetrical, despite so many people saying that like, oh, okay, Quebecers don't care about the rules, they're just doing whatever they want. Like, that's not what the data shows. What it did show is that Saskatchewan was, is quite, um, quite asymmetrical, and that showed us a story about what was happening there. We found that the government there was very late in recognizing what was happening. It, they were kind of lax with the rules and people just didn't care as much. Uh, and then there were like, because of that, there was a big outbreak there, it got pretty ugly. But it, again, it revealed what the actual story was. Um, also at CBC, we wanted to look at um, how much car sharing uh, services if they were causing burdens to the community. Anybody remember car to go when they were still around? Well, car to go had a public, um, kind of a public hidden API on their website that showed the real time locations of cars. So you could, you know, so you could see where the cars were. So again, I scraped this API every five minutes for a whole month. And then I plotted it on my map to see where are they concentrated the most at what time of day. This was done using k-means clustering. Uh, so the color is the time of the day where they're most likely to be at this place. And, well, it makes sense that 
the dark is at night, so cars are, are parked overnight. Why would they be, you know, moving around during the night? But we see that here downtown and right around, around here where we are right now is a cars that are found mostly during the day. R right outside here on the street, we went there during the daytime and saw that the whole street, Saint Dominique, Colonial, almost the entire street was taken by car to go cars. For people who work here, who work at you know all these startups, all these co-working spaces around here, and they were taking up the spots that are usually meant for residents, and the residents were pissed off. Uh, and this revealed some failures in maybe public transit, in maybe accessibility, uh, in other ways to get over here. And then other silly things like looking at the um, uh, the state of asphalt. The city actually has data that's showing like how how damaged the asphalt are for each like little block of a street. And so I compared it every uh, f from 2010 to 2015, and you can kind of see just in five years just how much the the quality of the asphalt degrades. So that was then. I want to talk about now. So this is my uh, organization now, the IJF. We launched in January. We're a small team, mostly young people. And our mandate is very data-driven. We do investigations in the public interest using data. Data is really our primary source of information. <coughs> Uh, some stories we've done <coughs> using data that were published recently is this one in, a so in a partnership with the National Post where we crossed a, a political donation data to uh, political appointments of judges and found that a significant amount of judges that were appointed were donors to the Liberal Party. Another one we did in, uh, connect in uh, collaboration with the Narwhal, which is another nonprofit that specializes in environmental reporting, where we looked at um, proactive disclosure data. That's politicians who disclose how much you know stocks and how much debt they owe and to who, and found that quite a few of them have interests in um, oil and gas companies, and they also ha work or worked in energy-related portfolios. I did this one recently where I looked at, um, anybody know what the access to information law is? Anybody heard of it? Right, it's, yeah, so if those who don't know, it's, it's the law that basically says that every Canadian can request information from the government that the government uh, retains, and the government has to give it to you in a reasonable amount of time. It is just this catastrophically broken in Canada. Uh, things take forever to process. Many times things come completely redacted. You can't see anything. It's all blacked out. Oops. And, um, and the government just has this burgeoning backlog where they just can't get through the request quickly enough. And so the government, so I crossed that with contract procurement data and found that uh, federal agencies are spending a lot of money outsourcing these access to information requests but their backlogs aren't getting any, um, any smaller. And one last one, one last bit of show and tell is where I wanted to map the revolving door between government and the private uh, sector. Uh, lobbyists in Canada have to disclose if they ever held a public office before. So I kind of mapped here uh, where in the government they used to work and who they're lobbying for today. And we found that one of the biggest sources of lobbyists is the Department of National Defense, where a lot of people go to work for defense contractors who lobby the Department of National Defense. And we can do this thanks to the databases. This is our bread and butter. We have eight databases that are uh, published every day, that are updated every day, right now on three issues, political donations, charity, finances, and lobbying. We're going to add more databases uh, regularly as time goes along. And we scrape these um, data from not only the federal government, but every province and territory that has that information. So we are a one-stop shop for data on um, issues of political importance all over the country. Nobody else does this. So you can go, for example, to uh, our website, Look up a name of a company that, uh, that, is, that lobbies the government. Choose a region 
whether the federal government, a specific province, or all over the country, what they're lobbying about, and see the records, historical records going all the way back as far as the data goes. So this, for example, an old record of Suncor lobbying about climate issues from way back in 2009. And that, those are the data that I used for this story that I'm going to tell you about. This is what I was invited to talk to today. Um, I w was curious to see uh, how many uh, lobbyists were attending liberal fundraisers. Uh, the liberal government was criticized in the past for allowing lobbyists to come. Uh, the Globe and Mail did a story back in 2017 about this. And I was curious to know how much was still going on. But using data instead of interviews, instead of people just kind of, um, you know, uh, talking about it, uh, telling a political reporter about it, I wanted hard numbers to prove. So that's what I set out to do. Um, it's not illegal, though. It's not a, it's, there's nothing officially wrong with a lobbyist attending a fundraiser. If you look at the lobbyist code of conduct, the federal government, it says that lobbyists shouldn't, re shouldn't really give gifts to someone who uh, they're lobbying. Um, attending a fundraiser, you have to give money to attend it. Is that considered a gift? It's not clear. It's not uh, explicitly defined as such. But it, you talk to democracy watchers, talk to people who follow this, they'll say, yeah, it's a little shady. But at the same time, the same code of conduct says that attending a fundraiser event is considered a lower risk political activity. And again, democracy watchers will say that these rules are um, toothless, that there are all these loopholes that just allow this kind of, uh, some shady dealings to happen. This is what the, my raw data looks like. I mean, this is what it looks like on the website, the Federal Lobbyist Registry. You go there and lobbyists have to declare who they are, what they're lobbying about, uh, how many times they communicated with the government, and also who, which ones of their employees are lobbying. This is what we scrape every day. When it's updated, we scrape it. We have a massive database with all this information that we can con uh, consult anytime. So for example, here are the names of lobbyists who work for the company. And this is the other data set I work with, fundraiser guests people who attended uh, fundraisers. Either they are in the um, Elections Canada website since 2019, but before 2019, they were um, they're on the Liberal website. So you have to uh, compile them from both sources if you want to look a little further back. And that's what it looks like. Each report showing all the guests that attended the fundraiser. You have names, you have city, you have postal code. And these are PDFs. Anybody who's ever tried to extract data from a PDF No, it is bad. PDFs are not data formats. They are document formats. It is a nightmare. And this is where we get to the fun part. We, here's the code. Tabula. Tabula is always on my, um, in my toolkit. It is an incredible uh, API to scrape, uh, turn uh, tables in PDFs into Pandas data frame. And Forget about all, all the code that's there. This is the good stuff. With one line, you can turn um, an entire document into um, a pandas data frame. If only it was that easy, a lot of PDFs, a lot of these um, lists of guests are not actual text PDFs. They're images. They're just pictures on the, in a PDF, which means you have to use another tool, OCR, optical character recognition. My favorite tool for that is able to extract. I don't know if they have an API. Maybe they do, but their uh, UI is, uh, is simple enough, and I had, they had few enough of them to go through that. I didn't mind doing it manually. There's probably about 20 or so I had to go through. Great. Now I have data. I have data of lobbyists, and I have a list of um, guests at fundraisers. How do I know how many went to fundraisers? And my favorite tool for that is Rapid Fuzz. Rapid Fuzz is for fuzzy matching. It uses something called a Levenstein distance to see how close names are. Because anybody who's worked with name data knows that people do not write their names the same way in every form, right? Sometimes they put a middle initial, sometimes they don't. Sometimes their last name comes first and then their first name. 
Sometimes um, people misspell their own names. So fuzzy matching is excellent for this, for catching these inexact matches, uh, names that could be the same person. And also very simple to use. You declare what your options are, basically the list of names, that list of words of strings that you want to compare to, and then go through the um, um, go through another list of strings and it compares it to the whole thing. It works surprisingly fast even for big data sets. And here's like an example of how that works. <coughs> they have all sorts of different um, sort of matching algorithms, how approximate it is. And you can see this, and it returns a, a score of how approximate it is. So if you take Arnold B. McKenzie and you compare that to McKenzie Arnold, right? Kind of all the same, except for this one. It's a partial token sort ratio. Uh, I won't go into the details of explaining, but the, the, the default one, which is called W ratio, it's a, it's a matching algorithm that works pretty well for names in my case. And you can also set a, uh, a cutoff, like only, only give me the matches that, are eight, that have a score of 80 or more, 90 or more, 70 or more, whatever. I found that 85, 90 is a good one. It's pretty, pretty close. It, it eliminates a lot of false positives. So great, now I had um, my matched names, fundraiser attendees, possible lobbyists, who it might also be. Um, but my goal here was to only look at active lobbyists. All lobbyists were registered with an active registration at the time of the fundraiser. I, my, my resulting match was like hundreds of thousands of rows long. So I love pandas, I work with pandas all the time. It's so elegant with a very simple little query. I can just isolate the ones whose fundraiser date was between the start date of the registration and the end date of the lobbying registration. And also created a, a column of, to make sure that, to s just to indicate as a flag if the fundraiser lives in the same province as the um, as their lobbying organization is registered. This was useful later for, for a reason I'll explain. Because just because people have the same name or a similar enough name does not mean they um, are the same person. And we definitely don't want to accuse someone of doing something that they didn't do. So this is where the good old uh, fashioned uh, journalism came in. Good old fashioned gumshoe um, uh, journalism where we have to go out there, we have to in, in inspect individual um, records. So I had here this table of attendees and the lobbyists that they got matched to, how close the name was, date of the fundraiser, registration date, whether they live in the same province or not. And then we just started going through each one and seeing, is it the same person? Is it likely to be the same person? Uh, do we need to contact them to ask them directly? Or did you go to this fundraiser? And this took, this was the, uh, the toughest part. It took several weeks. And we used all sorts of tricks in the book to, um, to find people. Uh, LinkedIn companies, uh, link, uh, LinkedIn profiles, their company websites. Do they talk about, um, do the lobbyists talk about um, uh, going to the fundraiser on Twitter? Their personal websites, do, do they have some validating information? based on their, uh, where they live, their city, their, uh, their postal code. <coughs> Canada 411, we looked up names in, in the city to see, in, to see if they live in the city that they said they did. Um, and if we really were in doubt, we called them up. We sent them emails and asked them. I think we sent something like 90 emails, about 12 of them responded, said, yeah, yeah, that was me, or nope, got the wrong person. But we wanted to make sure we had at least two confirmations, two data points that confirm, yeah, this is, this is either the same person or very, very probably the same person. Um, and it could be anything, right? Like I said, city, postal code, uh, even photos of faces. If the LinkedIn um, profile of the lobbyist matches the photo of someone who tweeted about uh, being at this uh, fundraiser. Um, and this was important because there are a lot of Susan Murrays in Ottawa and there are two Susan, Susan Maurice that are uh, lobbyists. And one of them went to a fundraiser and one don't. One didn't. So the, I made sure to, to verify and I 
And there, the Susan Murray who went to the fundraiser was not a Susan Murray who was actively lobbying at the time. Um, here's an example of uh, uh, what we used to, um, to verify someone. There was someone called Bev Goodman who went to a fundraiser. There's also Bev Goodman who is a registered lobbyist, happens to be the president of Ford Canada. Uh, I googled Bev Goodman and the postal code in the, in the fundraiser uh, guest list and found this on Google Street View and assumed, I think rather safely, that this is not the home of the president of Ford Canada. Great. We've uh, matched the lobbyists to the fundraisers. We validated if they're the same person or not. Now we can start doing the analysis, right? Not quite. Because when lobbyists register in the lobbyist registry, and it's the lobbyist's responsibility to register in the lobbyist registry, they can write whatever the hell they want in there. And different lobbyists uh, register their companies they represent in very, in very different ways. Rogers, communicate Rogers has at least five variations in the lobby registry. Bell Canada sometimes appears as Bell, sometimes as Bell Mobility, sometimes as BCE, sometimes as um, uh, Bell Media. Same company. And if I want to do accurate counts of how many companies were represented in these fundraisers, we have to standardize this, right? I think uh, in the data science world, you call this um, entity resolution. And my favorite tool for that is OpenRefine. Who's here heard of OpenRefine or used it? Oh, two people, wow, guys, this is an incredible tool for a cleaning update. It's made exactly for this purpose. It uh, was a Google project that got open sourced, and it is amazing for just manually um, uh, verifying or standardizing uh, names and company names and entities. Right? If you look at, this is, this is the actual lobbyist registry we're looking at here. If you search keyword Rogers, it shows you all the different variations. So no, I said five, it's way more than that. It's like 12. All the different variations of a company and as an incredible function called clustering, where it finds similar enough looking entries and clusters them and said, all right, do you want me to turn all these different versions of BCE to just one of them? One click, you can go through them all. Uh, it takes some time, especially big messy data sets like lobbying. This took me about a week to go through to standardize these company names, but in the end, I was able to finally do my analysis and find that TELUS sent 11 lobbyists to fundraisers. Or maybe they didn't send, but 11 people who at once lobbied for TELUS were at liberal fundraisers. Followed by College of Immigration Citizenship Consultants, CN, Amazon, um, a bunch of these companies. So now I had other questions. I found out companies, uh, lobbyists who were um, present at these fundraisers. But now I want to find out the more serious, sort of the more serious question here, which is, were, was, were, was a lobbyist present at a fundraiser where the minister they were lobbying was present? Because you can go to a fundraiser and you're, but you, with like Justin Trudeau, but you don't care, you're not really uh, lobbying the, the PMO, you just like want to hear him talk. Uh, who cares, right? But if, the, if the, it's a department or a minister that you're actually lobbying, I think this is a much, uh, becomes a lot more serious. So this is part of the fundraiser report that parties must, re, must, must uh, file. The prominent attendees, basically the ministers and the important people who were present at the fundraiser. So I scraped that as well, and I got a list of every minister at these fundraisers and looked at whether the lobbyist was actively lobbying that department that that, that minister represents. So if you look at here, for example, Food, Health, and Consumer Products of Canada, major lobby group. They represent huge companies like Coca-Cola, Unilever, uh, Kraft, right? They have to declare all the government departments that, that they want to lobby, and it's quite a bit. Turns out that one of their lobbyists went to the fundraiser 
where a bunch of those officials that they were lobbying were present. So that gave us a little bit more meat to our story. Um, and not only that, we wanted to see if the lobbyists had communications with the department that they were lobbying and whose minister was at the fundraiser. It's starting to get a little complicated, but it's just giving us more meat to our more um, more um, yeah more meat to our to our investigation. So lobbyists also have to declare their communications when they actually contacted a public official. So we see here that. Um, the Food, Health, and Consumer Products of Canada. Their lobbyists um, contacted someone at Finance Canada on August 10th, 2022, and people from Agriculture, from the PMO, from uh, Finance, from ICED on, um, when was this? On May 31st. The fundraiser date was June 13th, 2022. So it was within a month of those communications. So that's what I did. I looked at I, the, the lobby groups that were in contact the most with, um, with the departments with whom they were at the fundraiser event. It's getting complicated, I know. But again, this is just part of the investigation. And then I plotted it out. This is a one, almost a one-liner using Plotly. I love Plotly. Um, so what you see here is the bars are number of communications that the lobbyists did. And the red little stacks are communications with the department whose minister was present at the fundraiser. And these black dots here are the fundraiser dates. So I just looked at a window of two months, 60 days before and after the fundraiser to see how often they're communicating. And these are five lobby groups who came, who came out, who showed the biggest pattern there of uh, lobbying around these fundraisers. Here's my Plotly code. I love how, how elegant Plotly is. With just one command, you can create that small multiple of, of charts. Uh, stacked column with different color, uh, different uh, dif columns for uh, different color, um, and then just add a little some customizations here, updating the y-axis, making them uh, independent, um, making dashed lines for the uh, fundraiser date. Super easy to do. And finally, the report. My last uh, last uh, step is reporting it, writing it out. So I just did some very simple uh, charts as much as possible. The story is complicated enough as it is. So I just made the simple plots of all the fundraisers that they've hosted. There were lobbyists in about half of them. And of the 166 lobbyists who did attend these fundraisers, 137, a, a solid majority, were registered to lobby the minister who was present at the fundraiser. And Here's where it gets even, uh, even trickier. So there's a type of fundraiser called the Laurier Club. The Laurier Club is a exclusive club of people who really, really love the Liberal Party. And um, it's not considered a fundraiser, but to attend, you have to donate at least $800 to the Liberal Party. And then you're invited to this party. It's not a fundraiser. It's a party for big donors. And if you are a Liberal uh, Laurier, Cl Laurier Club member, you are exempt from some of those rules around lobbying and uh, fundraising because it's not really a fundraiser. So we found that most of these lobbyists who went to these fundraisers were Laurier Club members, which seems a bit like a pretty big loophole, if you ask me, where both the number of lobbyists and the amount they donated to be part of the Laurier Club was much bigger than any regular fundraiser that they uh, attended. So we wrote this, uh, published it, and had a pretty good response. Uh, the opposition parties took note and, um, and um, uh, publicly uh, denounced the Liberal Party for continuing to let these uh, lo lobbyists and not doing enough to filter them out at the door. Um, mostly the Green Party and the Bloc Québécois. The NDP was too busy uh, fostering a, um, 
they were in the middle of fostering a, a, a very delicate coalition with the liberals and the conservatives don't talk to anybody since uh, Polyev took over. They just ignore all media requests. So at least we got two parties on, on the record. And that's all I got. That's my spiel for you guys. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you. So if you have any question, just raise your hand and I will be your uh, mic. Yes, I love questions, please. So that was very fantastic, I love that. So one thing that I guess stands out from the work you do versus the work like other people who call themselves data scientists would do is that a lot of your work involves a huge amount of qualitative work to complement the quantitative. So what would you recommend for pe the typical very quantitative data scientist how to incorporate using qualitative work to improve what they do? That is such a good question and I don't know how to answer that very very cleverly. <laughs> what I w what I would say is that My work, like I said, my work, the data, the quantitative part is just the first part, right? It is, the data is there, n the data is not the story, the data is there to help us find the story. And stories are about people. It's always about people, right? Uh, throwing a bunch of stats at, 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 uh, at a reader in a, you know, in a regular news article is the best way to make them click off the page and go somewhere else. Stories that connect with people about humans keep people interested because that's what people connect with. People connect with human stories. So the, the most important part of the process is finding the people represented by the numbers, right? What are their struggles? Who, who is getting screwed by the system? Who is benefiting too much, right? And try to create a narrative out of that. Um, that's what I know how to do. And that is the only advice I would have is, yeah, talk to the people in the data. Hi. Um, sometimes uh, public websites restrict your ability to do scraping. You know, there might be legal concerns. So I'm just wondering if you've encountered those and what you think about when you're going to scrape data from one of those. Oh, websites. yeah. That's a question more for our, our, for our developers, but I can answer a little bit of what I've known from their challenges that they told me is that um, scraping should be kind of a last resort, right? Uh, you should always request, request the data. Ask them for a CSV. Ask them for access to, to their database. Ask them for an API. Um, most government agencies will just laugh in your face when you do that. So scraping is usually what you have to do in Canada. Thankfully, um, most government uh, uh, departments that retain data don't really make a stink about it. They don't block you. In a few cases, we have been throttled. In a few cases, our IP has been blocked. There there is nothing legal, there's nothing that legally protects these uh, uh, government agencies from doing this. Uh, so we just find ways around it. We, find, we use um, IP um, proxy uh, spoofers, right, that rotate IP addresses. We scrape um, at night when there is very little traffic otherwise. Uh, we just find ways around it, uh, these restrictions. Uh, we don't scrape anything that's copyrighted, right? This is, this is public information. It's not like we're taking other companies' data and making money off of it. So uh, we just find clever ways around it. Hi. <coughs> uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I imagine you've been doing this for a while and uh, people can be a bit and wavy about uh, data. And so how do you make sure that the numbers are convincing and credible and believable for the people that read your articles? Absolutely, great question. Uh, the most important thing that I do when I present my numbers is be incredibly honest about the uncertainties of it because I can't say anything with 100% certainty with public data. It's so messy. It's so inconsistent. It's all estimates. This is our best guess on what exists out there. Um, that's number one. Uh, number two is show our work. Uh, link to our, our sources. Um, have a, a, a solid methodology at the bottom. 
how we collected this data, how we uh, analyzed it. If we think it's of public uh, interest, we have discussions about this, but we will like post our, our code, our Jupyter Notebook uh, on GitHub. This is how we analyzed it. Nobody's ever asked for it. Uh, we offer it, but we, it's, it's there. If anybody asks or like, sh ask me, show proof, show your work, we will give it. And that's the best we can do. Thank you for the talk. Um, like it, it looks like so much work just to arrive at your the analysis part. Did it happen? Like, how many projects did it happen that you just look a little bit at the data and you, you're convinced that there is no story and stop there? Or like, did it happen that you had to do like two months of work and there's no story there? And oh yeah, could you give an example. I'll give you an example. Yes, um, it happens all the time. You have a question that you think the data might answer and then it doesn't, or there's just nothing there, everything's working fine. And sometimes that's a story. Sometimes things are working is, is, is a story to tell. I'm a big believer in solutions journalism, which is to, like, to show examples of when things are working as well as not working. I think it's important. So people don't just like get cynical about everything. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, one example is, yes, I, recently got a tip that the CRA, the Canada Revenue Agency, is Islamophobic and punishes uh, Islamic uh, religious charities more than any other um, uh, really type of religious charity. So I looked at audit data from the CRA, who they audited, who they revoked, and the numbers don't show that. Um, it's really small. Um, they've revoked more Jewish charities than than Muslim ones, uh, because there's also more of them. So, but even just it's for numbers, it's it, that didn't seem to uh, to bear out. So, so like, no, there's no there's no story there. <coughs> okay, uh, your research is based on public data, but you can also have situations where the data is not publicly available. For example. Like, say, for instance, CEO of a company could lobby a minister over a private dinner or something, or, 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 or like, the uh, contribution or donation to that party could be, you know, not at a fundraiser kind of thing. So how do you uh, – my point is that, I'll, you know, your research is not really based on all the data. Oh, absolutely. You are 100% you are right. We can only report on what we know – what has been reported on, what has been reported. Yes, what you say is absolutely true. Lobbying happens all the time in very informal ways in Ottawa. It's a kind of an open secret. Talk to any parliamentary reporter in Ottawa, and they say, like, oh, yeah, there are bars that lobbyists, like, go to, and they just bump into a minister or a, a, an associate minister. It's like, hey, how you doing? Didn't you, didn't you come here? Let me buy you a drink. Let's talk about energy policy, right? That's lobbying. That's not going to get recorded by anyone. So yes, so wh what we can report are on the people who are honest enough to report it, but there's a lot that goes on that we can't know. We just can't know. So that's where we have to be honest about our uncertainties. Like we say, these are only the, re the lobbyists who were registered to lobby, who, um, oh, and here's another thing. When a, pub when a government official calls a lobbyist, that doesn't have to be recorded. It's only when they receive a call from a lobbyist. So we have no idea how, mu how, how many go the other way. So we have to be absolutely honest about these uncertainties. And it's like, this is what we know. These are estimates. Yes. Uh, do you also use the financial statements of publicly traded companies to uh, draw correlations with uh, lobby activities? of ministers, and that w that's actually my second question. My first question was whether you apply the same analysis to the other political parties, especially to uh, uh, Poulievre, uh, maybe the reason why he was so, uh, how do you say, garrulous is because the Conservative Party of Canada, which is now leading the polls, is actively participating in the same type of activities. Thank oh. you. Oh, yes, the, uh, the, the opposition parties get lobbied as well. And yeah, we will eventually get there. Uh, we focus on the liberals because they are in power, and journalism's job is to you know, speak truth to power, to 
challenge power. So that's kind of like the low hanging fruit, right? So yes, we definitely will. We are not like, we don't have like a, a uh, an axe to grind against the Liberal Party. We will treat every party equally. For your first question, uh, financial um, data of public companies, we have not yet. Uh, we've, we have, however, um, analyzed um, grants companies that do get government government grants and if this uh, was a result of lobbying um, and we've also tried or we have we have the goal of trying to determine how effective lobbying is at changing policy this is an incredibly difficult problem because it's hard to make a one-to-one -one, uh, thing uh, we're maybe looking at uh, seeing if after lobbying on certain issues, certain politicians talk more about that issue in Parliament, in the Hansard um, uh, transcripts. Um, but again, this is a very difficult issue to, uh, to prove um, conclusively. There's been um, experiments in the US where they try to use uh, NLP to see you know, word frequencies after a s uh, with a time series analysis, but it's um, like you need a team of like, academics to help you not say something stupid. Yeah. I have maybe one question for you. Um, you're doing a lot of data visualization. Um, do you have good resources about good practices around data visualization, how to format some specific data, et cetera? That oh, good resources. Oh, yeah. I've, uh, I mean, I've, I've been inspired by so many great uh, data viz professionals. There are quite... Uh, journalism actually is uh, has been um, a really interesting petri dish for innovations in data viz. Uh, a lot of great designers and great uh, data people work in uh, news organizations and have innovated a lot of things. The the guy who uh, wrote D three the JavaScript library worked for the New York Times, right? Did a lot of his best work there. Um, the this isn't da data viz, but um, you guys heard of um, Django, the framework? That came out of a newsroom because they wanted to be qu uh, faster at, uh, at making these uh, applications. Uh, Django. Oh, uh, no, it was not the Washington Post. I don't remember, but it's Google search away. I'm sure you can find it quickly. Um, so with DataViz, uh, there are people like um, that, that, that are great to follow either on Twitter or in the Data Visualiz Visualization Society. Uh, Alberto Cairo, who uh, worked at Miami Herald many years. There is um, some folks out of The Guardian in the UK. There's His name escapes me. Um, oh, sorry? And Andy, yes, Andy Kirk is one of them, but I was thinking about another one. But thank you for that. By the way, there, there are lots of great people to follow who have written books on the topic, uh, who uh, talk about you know, how to make something complex simple and easy to, um, to, uh, to interpret, who talk about how the brain processes information visually, the difference between you know, bars and angles and how we process that information. Um, if you want specific, I'm kind of drawing a blank now, but if you want specifics, come talk to me and we can Jam a little bit on that. Last question. Okay, uh, these days, a lot of journalists or um, uh, newspaper companies or researchers are being censored. Uh, has your research or your company been censored on, on the information that you've, uh, that you've provided? We haven't been censored, but we have been stonewalled a lot. There's a lot of people who just will not talk to us. Um, I get a lot of no comments. I get a lot of emails that aren't responded. I get a lot of calls that aren't uh, answered. So, and these are from public officials, from media relations people, whose job it is to answer journalists because we, you know, we answer to the people. Um, is that a type of censorship? Debatable, but it is incredibly frustrating that there is very little um, consequence for you know um, people not being accountable. Okay, uh, so if you have any more questions, um, just ask to Roberto at the break. Uh, there is pizzas outside, and once again, thanks, Roberto, for the presentation. It was really great. Thank you.
Ça marche, ça marche. All right, um, so we are going to have our second speaker, uh, so Yann from uh, Polytechnic uh, Montreal is uh, going to present you some of his work on autonomous driving and using video games as a simulator. Thank you. Thank you. So, hello everyone. Uh, well, first, thank you for coming and also I want to thank the organizer for inviting me. I'm very glad to be here tonight. Uh, so, my name is Yann. Uh, I am a research associate at Polytechnic Montreal and I am working uh, mainly in uh, deep reinforcement learning for, sorry, deep reinforcement learning for robotics. So tonight uh, I will be talking about uh, this, so autonomous driving specifically, and this idea that since we are in Ubisoft tonight, uh, maybe uh, video games could become in the near future a good, uh, an interesting tool for the automotive automotive industry, sorry. So uh, let me contextualize this a little bit. So if you go to the, tes the Tesla website, you can see this um, announcement they made, which is basically saying that uh, they are currently getting rid of their traditional sensors. So they got rid of their LiDAR sensor, and now they're saying they're also getting rid of this ultrasonic sensor, which is another kind of rangefinder. Why are they doing this? It is because they are replacing everything, all traditional sensors, by computer vision. So uh, it seems to be, at least according to Tesla, the future of autonomous driving that um, autonomous car will drive from images like, like us humans. So here, this is a video that uh, I got from YouTube from some guy uh, who basically acts as Tesla to uh, see what the autonomous uh, autopilot system is seeing. So that's the uh, vision-based autopilot. And I would like to, uh, to start this talk, I would like to ask you a question, which is, uh, do, you, do you have any idea of this thing is working? Do you have any hypothesis um, about what this thing that you just saw, uh, or how, is this, how is this working? If you, anyone can give hypothesis, maybe. Yes? Yes. Right, yeah. So this, exactly, uh, we didn't see the GPS in this uh, video because it was just the visual, uh, it was just the perception part. But yeah, of course, you're right. There is the GPS and then there is the perception part happening. So if uh, I want to start, so first, the first idea that came to my mind is just hard coding. So uh, because especially actually in the video game industry, like if you think about Mario Kart, for example, uh, this so the, the way Mario Kart is driven by bots is fully hard-coded, and actually it's not even, it's not even uh, autonomous driving. It is just uh, displaying cars uh, at, so, at some, some, uh, sorry, at some relevant position on the track to give the player the illusion that the cart is driving. But you have other uh, games, like for example Gran Turismo, where uh, basically there is an AI which is driving the cars uh, as if it were a human player, but also uh, from hard-coded rules. And uh, because it is, oh, sorry, because it is very, very difficult to drive a car from hard-coded rules, even if you have access, full access to the state of the game, uh, they also have to buff the cars up. They have to give better statistics so that they are, they are challenging enough uh, for the players uh, to be fun to compete with, basically. But for the, com the context of uh, actual autonomous driving, here is something that is more relevant, which is uh, control theory. So control theory uh, is basically relying on, on the physics model of the world that has to be well understood 
and satisfy a bunch of assumptions. Typically, uh, the physics model has to be what we call uh, control affine in, in, uh, in this kind of uh, theory. So control theory is using this physics model of the world and uh, a cost function which describes the task that you are trying to complete uh, to derive a not an, uh, sorry to, der to derive a optimal controller. So you cannot do better than usual control theory approaches. Uh, but the problem with this is that you have to have this physics model. So <coughs> it's very useful when you can use this. For example, let's say you know the distance to the next car, and you also have some um, idea of the of the um, dynamics of your cars. Uh, you can use control theory to ensure that your car will not crash into the next car. So of course, that's very useful. But in general, you don't have this model because, uh, for example, if using images, it's totally impossible to do this. No, what you uh, saw the most in this video was actually supervised learning. So I think, uh, who, is, who is familiar with supervised learning, reinforcement learning, this kind of things? Kind of everyone? Okay, cool. So uh, supervised learning is basically, in uh, autonomous driving, used at, at two levels. Either the perception module or the control module. So for the perception module, that's what you saw in the video. Here we have, for example, I, I, I think I can zoom. Yeah, it doesn't work. Okay, <laughs> uh, here, for example, you have this um, you have this car which is segmented and this bounding box, and then it's labeled by uh, by a neural network, and this is typically trained via supervised learning. But something else you can do in autonomous driving is uh, control via supervised learning. How do you do this? Let's say your Tesla, for example, you have a lot of uh, drivers driving your cars. So you can collect data from these drivers. You can collect the sensor's outputs, and you can control. Uh, you can collect the control output from the drivers. So now you have a data set of sensors' uh, output and uh, control uh, inputs, and you can use this to train a policy. So a policy is a neural network that controls the car, basically. Uh, here, so this is what I represent as as the policy. Sorry, as the policy uh, pi theta here. So this is very nice, but it also has a bunch of limitation. Because you're actually trying to, to uh, imitate the policy of the expert, which is the policy of your drivers here, uh, you cannot be better than the policy of the ex expert, obviously. So the last approach, which I am personally more, more interested in, is reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is kind of the same idea. You're also training uh, this policy by theta here. But the way you're training this policy is different. You're training this policy uh, by optimizing a reward signal. So reward signal is kind of similar to uh, this cost function that we had in uh, control theory. And uh, basically, uh, RL is a bunch of techniques that will optimize your neural network such that it uh, maximizes this uh, integral of the reward over an episode with this discount factor gamma over there. So that's... That were the four, let's say, big approaches that, I, in my sense, make sense for um, autonomous driving. <coughs> and uh, the current self-driving cars are a mix of the three first things, essentially. But uh, if you think of humans, the way humans learn to drive or other things, uh, it's mostly reinforcement learning. I, uh, I mean, it's closer to reinforcement learning, in my opinion. And that's what I will be doing in this talk. So in this talk, I will be doing uh, vision-based end-to-end reinforcement learning in real time to control a car. In both cases, whether you are, you are using uh, supervised learning approaches or reinforcement learning approaches, you will need a simulator. Because uh, first, if you, are, if you are using something like supervised learning, you don't really want to uh, directly test your car in the real world. Of course, you will want some environment to test your car before you test it in the real world, otherwise you will uh, pro probably crash your car. So you can use a simulator to do iterative testing for this kind of development. But also, if you want to, let's say, derive a perception module, uh, it will be very nice to use a simulator for collecting uh, label data. Because if you collect da lab uh, sorry, data from the real world and label this manually, it will be very, very expensive. 
But if you do this for a simulator, you essentially have uh, labeled data for free. So that's very useful for supervised learning, but for supervised learning, uh, so sorry, for reinforcement learning, this is of paramount importance because DeepRL is basically uh, learning a controller via trial and error. <coughs> Which means that if you were trying DeepRL uh, deep controller in the real world, you would be crashing thousands and thousands of cars before you even start learning something that kind of makes sense. Of course, you don't want to do this, so you train in a simulation. Uh, for autonomous driving, in particular, there is this simulator which is very well known in the community, which is called Carla. Uh, Carla is an open source simulator. It is simulating many, many sensors. But for this specific application, which is so autonomous driving from vision, it has a bunch of issues. First, it is very computationally intensive. I think on my PC, I think it is uh, running below real time. And also, uh, rendering is not their main focus. They've most, they mostly focus on uh, physics and, and traditional sensors. But this image that you can see here is rendering from the, uh, from the Carla simulator. And I mean, it's OK, but it's not great, right? <coughs> so on the left hand side of this video, you have a Tesla, which is driving from actual images from the real world. And on the right hand side, you have uh, what I believe is the Forza Horizon 5 video game. And the point I want to make here is that video games like Forza are becoming very, very photorealistic. Right? So this brings this question. Can we, or in the near future, will it make, will it make sense to use video games as visual simulators, because you could see that they are so much more realistic than Carla in terms of in terms of visual features, of course. And also, they are lightweight. They are lightweight because they are video games. Carla doesn't really care about this, and they are super optimized for visual rendering because they are video games. So this game that I just show, Forza, uh, not only is vis visually realistic, but also the critics says that it has very uh, it is realistic in terms of physics. I don't know, I, don't, I didn't play this game, but uh, that's what people say. And also, uh, it gives uh, access to low-level information about the game to the users, to the players, via an API. So this is actually a very, very good candidate for this application, but, but it is not free to play. <laughs> Uh, I am uh, personally a, an academic researcher, so it's very important for me that people can reuse my work easily. And uh, if I were to use this, uh, people couldn't use this easily. They would have to buy the game. So instead of this, I will be using this super realistic simulator. <laughs> well, OK, so these are uh, flying cars with, with jet, jet packs in the, in the tire. So I was joking, obviously, realism is dead here. But uh, it is still very, very nice as a, a candidate for a proof of concept. Because it is very lightweight, it's also free to, free to play, so people can reuse my work. It has this track editor, which allows you to make your own track, so if you want to do uh, iterative training, that's very cool. It also has a um, video editor, uh, which you, you can shoot videos to basically show your trend policy. At the end of this talk, I will be uh, showing you a video made with this uh, editor. And it has this API, which is community supported, which also allows you to uh, to access low-level information in the game if you need to. Uh, for me, I will be using this API mostly for the reward function. So this is the training pipeline that I developed for this uh, application initially. And that has turned out to become a training pipeline for robotics in general. Uh, this training pipeline is based on two, uh, sorry, four open sources libraries. So here you have first you have this virtual gamepad library, which is uh, literally emulating a gamepad on your PC, so that you can control any video game from a Python script. That's based on VGEM, if some of you know that. It's a, it's a framework for doing this. Uh, and so th this is uh, controlling Trackmania directly. And now I encapsulate this in this real-time gym library, which I'll be, I will be talking uh, about in more detail later in this talk. <coughs> And uh, then my, my training framework, per se, is called TMRL. And TMRL is based on this uh, TLS Python object library, 
which is my less starred repo for some reason, but it's also one of my favorites. Uh, it, is a, it is a network library that uh, allows you to transfer pickled objects over the internet in a secure fashion. Because I don't know if you know this, but pickled objects are a very huge security breach. Uh, if someone sends you a pickled object and you just decompress them, they can execute uh, basically random codes, random codes on your machine. So of course you want to secure this, and uh, we use a, a TLS uh, sorry, a TLS tunnel to secure the, this transfer. Okay, so that's the high level view, but let's get back to our uh, goal here, which is uh, to drive in real time from images. Now let's imagine we are neural networks, uh, which we are, by the way, I think. Uh, <laughs> So let's say we have this image as, as input, and now can we produce a relevant output? Of course we can't, because we are missing a lot of information here. We're missing uh, first order dynamics, like the, the velocity of the car, the acceleration, angular dynamics, etc., etc. In reinforcement learning, this is known as the Markov property. So essentially what the Markov property is saying is that you have to feed your neural network with uh, information that is um, sufficient, uh, I mean, basically all the information that you need to predict the effect of the action that your neural network is computing. So instead of a single screenshot, I'm using this history of four screenshots equally spaced in time. This is like a, a video where basically the neural network can infer this uh, first uh, dispersed order dynamics like uh, velocity, angular acceleration, etc., etc. Uh, just to help the training, I also give these three values, which are very uh, easily available for real-world self-driving cars because they are the speedometer reading, the tachometer reading, and the current gear. Now, this is my new observation space. Is this no approximately Markov? The answer to this question is no, but the reason is a bit tricky. So to answer this, we have to go back to the fundamental of, deep of uh, reinforcement learning. So uh, here is how we usually represent a Markov decision process. I mean, one of the representation. So in an MDP like this, you have first to capture an observation. Then you have to send this observation to the agent. Then your agent has to compute an action from this uh, observation. Then you send this action to your environment. And finally, you apply this action in the environment, and then the environment uh, outputs a new action, a new observation. So this is very uh, well adapted to uh, scenarios like board, game, board games, for example, like chess. Uh, let's say you, you are playing chess. Here you can basically capture an observation. From this observation, which is the, the state of the chessboard, you can uh, compute an action. And now, let's say our action is to move this pawn from here to here. We can do this and instantly move on to the next state. And then start over again. We can compute a new, uh, capture an observation, capture a new observation, compute a new action, etc., etc. But as soon as we enter the realm of robotics, people start doing weird things. So for very long, uh, for a very long time, we've been using this Mujoko benchmark to uh, benchmark reinforcement learning algorithm on wannabe robotic tasks. Um, but to do this, what we do actually in practice is that we pose the simulator to capture observation, to compute an action, then we apply the action to the simulator, and then we unpose the simulator for a certain amount of time to step to the next uh, state where we again pose the simulator, etc., etc. This works in the simulator, but in the real world, this doesn't work, of course, because you cannot pose the real world. And in fact, this is very significant even for humans. Here you have this video of a football player which is catching a ball. It was a bit fast, so I will play it again in slow motion. So here is the ball that the guy is trying to catch. And the first thing you need to know is, OK, for the photon to reach your eyes, basically, this is instantaneous. But once these photons has, have reached your eyes, it takes your eyes about 24 milliseconds to be able to uh, trans transform this information into electrical signal and send this, in, uh, this signal to your brain. But that's not the only delay that there is in this application. Because once this uh, 
information has reached your brain in the form of electrical signal. It takes your brain 120 milliseconds approximately to be able to react on the basis of this information. So I call the first of these delays the observation delay and the second the action delay. The total delay, which is the sum of the action and observation delay, is non-negligible at all in this application. Actually, this is the true uh, total delay, measured it, and you can see that uh, here it is corresponding to this entire trajectory. And yet, when you play these games, you don't really notice this delay. And the reason why you don't is very interesting. So you have this uh, study from the University of Melbourne, which basically shows, so it's a neuroscientist study, and they basically showed that what you are seeing in your brain is not what is coming from your eyes. Instead, it is a prediction of what your eyes would see uh, when the action that your brain is computing will finally get applied in the real world. So it's really a prediction of the future that you're seeing in your eyes, in your, in your head, sorry. In terms of deep learning, this is what it means. So here we have the action that we are uh, trying to compute. It will be applied in the future. To compute this action, we have to somehow predict the state in which it will be applied. So the neural network, ne the, sorry, the neural network needs a way of, uh, of doing this. It needs a way of computing this, this uh, state in its latent space. To be able to do this, it needs the information that it receives from the eyes and the action that it knows it is currently performing. So this is my final uh, observation space. It's what I described before, plus this history of two actions over there. One action is to account for the observation delay, which in this case is the time required to capture a screenshot. And the second action is to account for the action delay, which in this case is the time required by the neural network to compute an action and to actuate. So that was the theory. Now, how do we implement this in practice? Uh, is anyone here familiar with the OpenAI gym interface? Oh, okay, some people are familiar. That's that's all right. Okay, for the for the other for the others, uh, OpenAI Gym is basically uh, the way the the streamlined way uh, that we use for reinforcement learning uh, policies to interact with MDPs with environments. So here is how, how this works basically. Here you have this uh, gymnasium make function that basically produces your environment. And then the first thing you do is call this unreset function here that will uh, gives you an initial observation. And then you have this uh, initial observation, so you can give it to your, to your model to compute your first action. And now you have this action, you will uh, use the step function uh, basically to retrieve a new observation and also reward, and then you can use this uh, new observation to compute a new action and so on and so forth. How is this possible in a real-time setting? Well, first you have this reset function, uh, which in real-time gym, okay, sorry, by the way, a real-time gym is uh, an open source library that we developed uh, exactly for this application, which is uh, to implement real-time uh, tasks as open AI gym environments. So, yeah, you have this uh, reset function, which basically is the function where your robot does whatever it needs to uh, reset the, its state. And then you get a first observation, an initial observation from this reset function, which is a O0 here. But now, because you are in a real-time setting, you need to apply an action at all time. Why do you need to do this? Because you need some time to compute your first actual action. So here we apply the action A0, which is typically the action of doing nothing. And uh, we compute our first action A1. So A1 is based on O0, which is the initial observation, and on A, uh, and on A0, oh, sorry, which is the, um, the action that you know you are currently performing. In the meantime, a real-time gym also launched the capture of an observation. And now we are here. We have computed our first action. So we can use the step function and give it to the environment. So in real time, Jim, basically this step function is waiting for the observation capture to finish. That's how you get a time step in real time following the OpenAI Jim interface. Now we can do another step uh, step, which is okay. We compute a new action, and uh, with this new action is based on the observation that we captured here, and also based on the action that we. Uh, computed in, an, in the previous time step and are applying right now, etc., etc. 
No, that was for the environment, no about the training framework that we use. So uh, I don't know, I, I expect not many people are familiar with RLE because you didn't seem familiar with uh, RTG, uh, sorry, with uh, GM either. So that's basically a training framework which is, uh, no, which is based on a very uh, well-known framework in reinforcement learning which is called RLLib. And uh, basically this is uh, how it works. So we have several rollout workers here which are uh, in our case several PCs each running an instance of the Trackmania video game. And we, we retrieve uh, training samples from these uh, rollout workers. Now we transfer, the, we transfer them to this uh, server via the, this uh, TLS secure communication and forward them to the trainer, which is in charge of training our neural network with the uh, samples, with the samples gathered for all, from all the rollout workers. Now the trainer can forward back this, uh, this updated weight to the server and back again to the rollout workers and so on and so forth. So that was the high-level view of it. Now is a more fine-grained view of it, I guess. So the point of, of this framework, which is called TMRL, is that it allows you for robotics application to do very fine-grained operation, which uh, allows you to develop optimized pipelines for specific applications. So here in this specific application, which is application that I described with Trackmania, I have, for instance, I have, for example, this history of four screenshots in my observation space. Now, this history of four screenshots I need to give to my policy so that it can compute an action. But I must also send it to my trainer, which is typically located over the internet in a GPU cluster. So I don't want to send this entire of um, information because it's an history of four screenshots for four, scr four time steps, sorry. So there are three screenshots which are overlapping at each time step. So I can get rid of these uh, three screenshots, that's what I do, and then I'm left with uh, a last screenshot which I compress in PNG format because I don't want to lose any information. And I transfer this to this, uh, to, to this trainer via this TLS tunnel here. And finally, uh, TML allows me to do a bit of whatever I want uh, for storing these compressed samples and uh, sampling. So there is a trade-off here, which is either uh, we, can we can store in the memory directly the compressed samples, and then sample from this memory of compressed samples, so we have to decompress at the moment of sampling, which means that you have low memory usage, but you, have, you are highly computational at the, at the moment of sampling. Or you can, do, uh, you can decompress uh, when storing in the memory and then sampling directly uh, instantaneously. So TML basically allows you to do these kind of things which are, which are not done by other frameworks. So uh, this, well, in this application, I do a kind of mix of, of this thing which I believe is, uh, is uh, optimal for this pipeline. And uh, don't now I have my uh, reconstructed uh, sample here, which I can use in my trainer to train my policy, and then forward back this policy to the rollout worker, as, as I described before. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so to, f to finish this uh, thing, uh, I also need a reward function. So. Because uh, this is Trackmania, we're trying to race, basically. That's, a uh, that's the reward function that I use. So I have access to this uh, Open Planet API. So what I do is I, I basically choose a track. It can be any track at all, because it's fully vision-based, as you saw. And uh, I recall myself uh, doing a demonstration trajectory like this. doesn't have to be a good trajectory. It just has to follow the road like this. And then uh, I cut this into equally spaced points. And now my reward function is the number of these checkpoints that the car passes at each time step, which, if you think about it, is exactly what we want to optimize in Trackmania. We just want to get from point A to point B as fast as possible. So uh, I'll show you a video of the result of this approach in Trackmania. So that's uh, fully vision-based and uh, running at 20, uh, 20 frames per second. I'm talking about the AI. And I'm using this track, which is one of the official tracks from the uh, Trackmania campaign uh, of last winter. So this is uh, basically the best... So I trained the policy for uh, 30 hours, 
using this framework that I described. And now this, what you're seeing right now, is uh, the best of my runs uh, so of the final policy selected over 1,000 uh, 1, examples. So that's the best over 1,000. Obviously, it's not bad. And if you want, uh, so if you want, after the talk, I can also show you the the 1,000 runs uh, because they actually have a lot of variants. I think even after 30 hours, the the policy was not fully trained. So to conclude this talk, so I just wanted to uh, stress on this idea that uh, maybe because the autonomous driving industry is going toward vision-based methods, uh, it could be an avenue uh, for video games to become a tool for these methods, I mean, in terms of visual simulation. And also, maybe in the context of video games, since this is Ubisoft here, uh, I, I, I want to add that maybe what you just saw uh, could precede a very highly human-like bots. Because if you think about it, it was uh, driving from screenshots in real time, like human. And it was also driving uh, using a, a, a virtual gamepad. Actually, you could use exactly the same approach to uh, make a robot that drives looking at the screen and using a real gamepad. It would work also, it would be exactly the same thing, but it would, of course, be uh, technically more difficult to implement. Also, it's not very clear whether a deep reinforcement learning reasoning is very different from that of humans. So that might be something to think of for the future. So that's all for me. Thank you uh, very much for attending. And now, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. <laughs> So do we have question? Yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And I noticed that you, uh, just because I read about the TMRL, I noticed that you choose like 20 hertz to be the control frequency. Why you choose 20 hertz as your control frequency? Because I noticed that for the Sony's paper on the nature, they use like a 60 hertz and 10 hertz, something like that. So what's the reason for you to choose 20 hertz as your control frequency? Okay. Uh, well, first, the Sony paper that you're referring to, they were training at 60 Hz, but they were evaluating at 20 Hz. So it was, a, but also they were using a lot of low level information which allowed them to do this. Here it would not be possible. Uh, we have to evaluate at the same frequency as the training frequency because we're using this frequency as uh, our base for the video, uh, that the, the video of um, screenshots, right? Uh, why are we using 20 Hz? If you, you didn't really notice in the first video, but uh, the neural network frequency at this, uh, in this first video, maybe I can come back, or I don't know. Uh, in the first video, it was about 13, 15 Hz, the, the neural network frequency. So it's actually what they use in real uh, autonomous cars. So I guess that's a, that might be a reason, yeah. The very notion of the reward changes your, uh, the transition uh, matrix from different states in your uh, conceptual model. And that undermines the notion of a Markovian process, which is supposed to be memoryless. When you have a reward function imposed, that means that as the system evolves, the behavior change, and therefore you're introducing uh, a concept of memory in the system. Though the system can never really be Markovian. Uh, the other question I have, you mentioned you're an academic researcher, so I'll ask you this particular question, and it might require a little bit of uh, brainstorming, but the whole notion of, uh, of reinforcement learning draws upon a, a, another uh, type of uh, approach that is, uh, is done in, in these reward-based systems, in particular in operations research. And I would like to know whether you can draw parallels or, uh, how do you say, connections between approaches that are done in reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning 
and the intimate or evader type models that we see in operations research. Thank you. Uh, okay. Okay. Thanks for the question. Uh, so first, for your first uh, comment, uh, I'm I'm not quite sure I follow because you said that the fact that you use a reward makes the Markov assumption uh, irrealizable. Is this right? Uh, I don't think it's correct because, uh, yeah, to this, let's say that. Actually, the, the reward function is part of how you define uh, your MDP. It's really part of that. And as long as the MDP is fixed, uh, whether you're, you're going in some part of the MDP or some other part of the MDP, the reward function itself, which is uh, the function from state and action to reward, uh, is fixed, is, is defined, right? So it doesn't change uh, during training. So I think it doesn't really, uh, it, it you, you can still uh, have the mark of session assumption that is uh, well uh, defined. And that, that's actually the entire theory of deep reinforcement learning built upon this. So that was for the first comment. But the second comment, uh, so you are, you are saying that uh, w can we um, draw parallels between operational research and deep reinforcement learning. So to the best of my knowledge, uh, operational research is dealing a bit like, basically a uh, control theory, the thing that I, I presented at some point, is based on operational research. It is uh, this situation where, where you have a model of the world which is perfect and satisfies the relevant assumptions. And uh, you can use a solver, which is the same solver as you would use in any uh, op operational research uh, problem, to find an optimal uh, controller. But deep RL is usually concerned with uh, the problems where this is not possible because you don't have a perfect model of the world. So basically, you. I think it's not the same scope. You have operational research, you want to use this when you can, but DeepRL is like a solution for where you can't. Just one more question. Uh, No. Uh, wha why do you believe that uh, this would violate the mark of assumption? Because uh, so real-time training, you you t you you're referring to the, to the fact that we train in um, MDP in real time. Yeah. I mean, no, because the MDP itself, uh, the the definition of the MDP is based on the mark of assumption. It, it is Markov by definition, and then you train maybe in real time or maybe not in this MDP. So no, that doesn't violate the. No, no, no. So what breaks the Markov assumption is basically when uh, you don't have enough information from the past to have, a f well, actually the Markov assumption is never, uh, real, uh, is never satisfied in practice because it would mean that you would feed your neural network with the entire information about the universe, which is of course absurd uh, in, in the general, ca general case. But that's what breaks the uh, Markov assumption is that you don't have enough uh, information uh, in your neural network to actually really predict what's going to happen in the future. Oops. We can take talk this uh, off offline if you want. Okay. So, uh, thank you so much for the question, uh, for the uh, presentation. It was awesome. I was sort of wondering because, from my understanding, reinforcement uh, uh, learning algorithms work inside an environment. So we're talking about chess. You have a number of states that you can be in in your entire training. How does your algorithm in reinforcement learning or in deep area of reinforcement learning? work when it's uh, getting events that it's never seen before. 
So I'm talking about, let's say with cars, for example, if we have a lot of different training material and simulations where it's bumping into cars, it's bumping into posts, it's bumping into walls, it's learned all about that, but uh, it's never seen a cat. And then you put it in real life for the first time and there's a cat walking down the road. How would it react? Would it assume that it's, on, would it have a response like a human, drive away, or would it just be like, wow, oh, this is nothing, I've never seen it before, run through it, kill the cat, everybody's sad? Yeah, thank you, that's, that's a great question. Um, yeah, actually, second option. So, <laughs> um, yeah, what you described is known in robotic as the seem to real gap. And actually, that's a, a more, uh, that's a more general concern of, okay, I am in this situation I have never seen before, uh, how do I react? So, uh, especially in robotics, uh, actually a simulator is never the same as the real world, especially if you train Trackmania and then, okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, you, you still you always have this discrepancy. So of course, people have come up with uh, approaches to um, kind of alleviate this problem. Uh, the maybe most well-known approach to alleviate this problem is basically to randomize your simulation as possible, to make it as random as possible. Just input uh, all kind of random stuff in the simulation, so that at some point. Uh, your simulation kind of encapsulates the real world uh, in some sense. In this, uh, this uh, really uh, helps alleviating the sim to real gap. This is called uh, random domain randomization. And you have other approaches which are also um, at least as interesting. Uh, in particular, there is this paper which is called Rapid Motor Adaptation that, that uh, was published uh, a while ago, where uh, these guys are basically it's hard to explain, but they are trying to um, they are trying to model. Uh, so they are trying to do some some tricks so that the robot, when it's deployed in the real world, uh, encapsulates uh, some kind of meaning that it has seen in simulation. I, I know it's not very clear, but basically, let's say you have a simulator with parameters, and you can uh, tune these parameters as you want. So you can. Uh, basically give random parameters which will give you random simulations and now you can use this vector of parameters as an input to a new neural network that will tell you uh, that will uh, basically be an encoding to encode uh, these parameters and and these guys they have a, a way of measuring the same thing in the real world which will uh, project in the same latent space and then they use this as an input to their policy so their policy knows that what they're seeing in the real world is this thing that they saw in the simulator, more or less. So yeah, thank you for the question. So thank you again, Jan, for this great presentation. Um, so you can upload. <laughs>